when we talk about reaction mechanisms, we have to consider that some of the reactions that we you know, understand to occur in a single kind of reaction as written may actually take part in many individual steps. And so when discussing this, we're gonna have some terminology and we'll start by talking about that. We'll see that an elementary step of a reaction will be one that makes up the greater whole. So it's kind of a, an individual reaction that contributes to the overall reaction. And when we talk about an individual step, so say we're, we're talking generic reaction, we might say that this is our overall reaction, right? We have A plus B goes to C plus D. But, wow, my hair is totally crazy. Let's fix that. There we go. Um, maybe what's happening is we have A turning into E first, and then really it's E plus B that, I don't know, let's, let's say plus C, uh, that turns into D or something. And so really, we might have something that's hidden, a part of the reaction that's not present in our overall formula. And we'll look at a couple of examples, of course, but just generically speaking is maybe there's something hidden within it. This, that would be an overall reaction. These would be elementary steps. So individual reactions within that that are actually happening uh, underneath the scenes, as it were. Those are the actual steps that are happening. And we can tell this by looking at our overall reaction and determining the rate law from the equation. Is our rate simply K times A times B? If it is, then our overall reaction is an elementary step. It's, the, it's already there. It's done. But we saw that it's always dangerous to play that game because very often your reactions will not have those rate laws. And so we might actually see that the rate of, uh, of this particular reaction, maybe it's rate equals K times E times B. And it's like, where did E even come from? So we may not even have uh, components in our overall reaction. Well, we shouldn't ever see E there because uh, E is an intermediate as we'll see, but just for, for um, practicality's sake, you might be like, well, how come this rate doesn't depend on A? You know, we'll see. So uh, we'll see how this uh, will turn on when we look at uh, multi-step mechanisms. But the idea here is just being able to name these. So we have an overall reaction that is made up of elementary steps. And again, some reactions that don't have further elementary steps, Sometimes they do, sometimes they have three, sometimes they have two, sometimes they have four or 18, who knows? So that's just the idea of elementary step. When we look at these, we can also talk about the molecularity of a step. And that question, the question that, that that term answers is how many molecules are involved? How many are reactants in a particular step? And this includes coefficients. So because maybe two molecules of A combine to do something weird. But assuming these coefficients are all one for our fake things, we would call this step unimolecular. A single molecule decomposes and undergoes some reaction. This reaction here is bimolecular. It is made of two molecules doing something, in this case, combining to make product D. And of course, it's, it's extremely rare, which is a hint that you've probably done something wrong, but Something like this, 
here we could even say this was an elementary step of a reaction. This would be called termolecular, meaning there's three reactants. We saw that when we talked earlier about how reactants happen, it's very difficult to even get two molecules to hit each other in the right direction with the right energy. We saw that it was one out of 10 trillion H2 and I2 molecules that hit each other with the correct orientation, let alone the correct energy. So imagine three molecules now, all three have to hit at the same time in the right orientation, all with enough energy. It, it's almost impossible. It's so remote, the, the idea of that, that it's just not something that we see. So really we're limited to unimolecular and bimolecular steps. And when we're looking at these steps, again, this is kind of a bad example because we have an, what's called an intermediate here, but let, let's talk about that actually. E in this case, notice if we put these two reactions together, if we added them, A turns into E plus C, E plus B turns into D. If we add those reactions together, we do get our overall reaction, according to Hess's law, right? We, we get them back together again with these steps. But notice that we produce E in one reaction and then get rid of it in another reaction. We consume it in the second reaction. E, therefore, is called an intermediate. E is an intermediate. It is produced and then consumed within the same um, reaction, overall reaction. So it doesn't show up because it's made and then it goes away. So it's called an intermediate. And on a reaction diagram, a reaction coordinate diagram, what that looks like is if we're having multiple reactions happening, multiple elementary steps within a reaction, that might look like this. Now we have two humps. Here we have A. Here we have E plus C. And then we have C plus D, C just kind of stays there. We have, of course, transition states, two of them. We have transition state one, transition state two. They have their own activation energies. Note that activation energy two is uh, related to the intermediate, which is C. We call that part which is E, that's called the intermediate. And interestingly, because intermediates are at kind of a valley in terms of energy, we can isolate them. You can isolate an intermediate and find its presence there. That's how we might know. We might look at the overall reaction and say, well, there's clearly no E here. But maybe at some point during this reaction, molecule E was discovered there. But it's like, what are you doing? Where did you come from? E then is an intermediate. It's something that's produced in one step of the reaction, and it's going to be consumed in the second step. So kind of what's happening here at, at part A, where we have, well, technically it's A plus B. We have A plus B in there. At some point, with enough energy, A splits into E and C. We still have compound B floating around in there. And now B and E are going to combine. Again, that's another energetic hump. And then we end up with products C and D out of it. So E shows up in the reaction coordinate as an intermediate. And so terminology there. When we're looking at elementary steps, The rate laws follow the stoichiometry. So that means if we have this reaction, A turns into B, the rate for this would just be K times A. And if we have another reaction, 
a bimolecular reaction, the rate or the rate law for this equation would be Ka squared. It's simply the coefficients of your reactants, right? We have two A turning into B, so our rate constant will be Ka squared. If we had A plus B goes to C, another bimolecular reaction, the rate would be K times A times B. So for elementary steps, this is true. We can finally use our assumption. And that's very valid. So we can totally do this. These are for union bimolecular reactions. We don't really see additional ones, but just in case, in case you were to see one, why not? Let's just have this two molecules of A plus one of B. Here we could even put that. 2A plus B turns into C, although again, not very common, although with mechanisms we might see it. The rate for this step, a termolecular step, again, not likely, but a termolecular step would have the following. It would be Ka squared times b. Or if we have a plus one half b turns into c, our rate would simply be k times a times b to the one half power. So plenty of options. Remember these need not be integers, right? Just take your coefficients and put them on your, your rate law. That's what it is for elementary steps. And when we take a look at our next video, we'll see how the idea of these rate laws uh, will affect what we know about mechanisms and whether intermediates are present or what may happen.